My name is Michael Rourke, and I am the interim director of the MSU Center for Interdisciplinarity. And the Center for Interdisciplinarity is a co-sponsor, along with the Office of the Vice President for Research and Graduate Studies, of these interdisciplinary research forums. Today, our forum focuses on doing research together, the science of team science. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy week uh, to spend it here with us. Um, the, the Center for Interdisciplinarity has, spons has worked with the Office of the Vice President for Research for uh, a couple of years now to facilitate the delivery of opportunities like this. These are opportunities that are designed to give you a chance to meet new people, have conversations about common interests, hopefully expand your network a little bit, and perhaps launch a, a new collaboration or two. Um, because that's the, the goal of these events, uh, what we do is ask that, basically just give you one assignment, right? So you have an assignment that we'd like you to, to uh, um, you know, execute at some point during the afternoon, and that is to meet somebody new and have a, a just sort of introduce yourself, talk to somebody that you haven't met before. Um, you know, I, for all academics, probably all overachievers, you can maybe even meet two people. <laughs> um, the uh, typical sort of order of events and the one that we'll pursue today involves a welcome, like this one, followed by introductions, which I'll talk about in a second. And, and then we uh, turn to the program. I'll be the MC of the program. I have an opportunity to introduce the topic and then also introduce our speakers. The speakers will then um, go in order, uh, each delivering lightning talks. Um, and uh, at the end of about a, an hour, uh, we'll all just sort of drink for free on the vice president um, and eat for free on the vice president. So that's kind of the idea. As I mentioned, I'm MC of today's festivities, so I have the distinct pleasure and honor of, of introducing the topic and then our illustrious panel of speakers, um, again, each of whom will uh, be delivering lightning talks of no more than five minutes. Um, and uh, uh, I'll introduce each of those individuals uh, prior to their uh, presentation. Um, the, the topic of today is the science of team science. And the science of team science, uh, as a, a technical term or name for this domain or field evokes a couple of other domain names, uh, team science and the science of teams. You can think of um, team science as uh, collaborative empirical research that aims to discover how the world works. And uh, it's research conducted by collaborators who operate in functionally interdependent ways. Um, typically in the literature when it's described, it's, it's, it's described as involving different types of expertise. So being multidisciplinary or interdisciplinary. There are a wide variety of different resources available for folks who engage in team science. I imagine almost everybody in this room engages in one way or another in team or collaborative research. A team science toolkit, which is maintained by the National Cancer Institute, is a really great resource for people who do this sort of work. The science of teams is different. It uh, focuses on research into the nature of teams and, and the function of teams. It's been around for more than 60 years uh, in psychology and management. Uh, the questions that they focus on include how do teams function, what can be done to enhance the effectiveness of teams. Michigan State University has been a hotbed for this sort of research for quite a long time. Um, we've had, uh, I think, a, 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 num a large number of really high profile researchers, several of whom are in this room. Um, two of whom are on our panel. Uh, this is a paper by uh, Professors Kozlowski and Ilgen. Um, I just pulled this off the, the website last night, off the web last night at uh, Google Scholar tells me it's been cited 2,070 times, so probably as of now it's been cited more than that. Um, but uh, this is from 2006, and just an example of the kind of work that emerges from Michigan State on the science of teams. And the science of team science is a complex combination of perspectives from team science and the science of teams. You can think of the science of team science as research into the nature and performance of teams that aims to better understand the circumstances that facilitate or hinder effective team-based research and practice. All, again, Michigan State is home to quite a few people who engage in this sort of work and have, have taken leadership roles in contributing to the science of team science, and including uh, another couple of people on our panel, uh, uh, Dr. Trubel and uh, Serrano. Uh, they uh, were responsible, along with co-authors, for this 2014 paper that's had quite an impact 
on uh, the science of team science, especially in the natural resources domain. I draw a couple of slides from Dr. Kara Hall, who's a social psychologist and leader in the science of team science. She likes to think of the science of team science as a, or, or sites as a cross disciplinary field, a study that aims to build an evidence base and then also um, develop translational applications that can help enhance the efficiency and effectiveness of team-based research. The second slide that, that I draw from Dr. Hall is this timeline of uh, uh, big moments in the brief history of the science of team science. A couple, uh, just to note, there's the Science of Team Science Conference. Um, it's happened nine times before. It will happen a tenth time in uh, Lansing in May. More on that in a minute. Um, and then also I want to call your attention to uh, the National Academy's consensus study on the right at the bottom there, which was published in 2015. Um, Dr. Kozlowski is an author on that particular study. And that sort of uh, really kind of pulls together the, the, the leading ideas in the literature on science of team science up to that point. Now, the community of, of participants, community of, of individuals who consider themselves a part of the science of team science uh, includes representatives from three other communities. So of course, there are the scientists of team science, people who study how science teams operate, what can be done to enhance their capacity. There are also practitioners or scientists or other researchers who engage in collaborative research. And there are also team science providers, those who provide resources, tools, approaches that, uh, that practitioners and scientists of team science can avail themselves of. Representatives of each of these communities will be uh, joining us in, in Lansing in May from the 20th to the 23rd down at the Lansing Center when the 10th annual Science of Team Science Conference will be held. Um, it's going to be a great show. All the people on there who are speaking today are going to be speaking at that event. Um, we are motivated in part to deliver this interdisciplinary research forum by the desire to kind of um, spread the excitement. Right. Get others, get you folks, if you haven't already thought about this, maybe get you excited about attending and participating in CITES 2019. With that, as an uh, introduction, I'll go ahead and introduce our first speaker. Um, our first speaker today will be uh, Dr. Dan Ilgen. Dr. Ilgen is John A. Hanna Distinguished Professor Emeritus at Michigan State University in the Department of Psychology and Management. He's a fellow of the Association for Psychological Science the American Psychological Association, the International Association of Applied Psychology, the Academy of Management, and the Society for Industrial and Organizational Psychology. His work is in the general areas of work motivation, team behavior, performance evaluation, and leadership. He'll deliver a presentation today on team science as a culture for research with multidiscipline teams. Dr. Ilgen. Thank you, Michael. Well, uh, about uh, 10 years ago, I got a call from someone at the National Research Council asking me if I'd chair a workshop on the science of team science. And when I was in thinking about that, the, the first thing I thought, you know, I'm not sure we need this. Do we really need this? We know a lot about teams. This is, uh, and we know a lot about the science of teams. Uh, so why do we need to come up with another uh, area? And I also think it's a little risky because in the in when you look at teams and you look at the applications related to teams, there's a lot of snake oil dealers and and fads and folly all that goes on in this area. And, and did we really need this discipline that's going on? And I looked at teams at a long time. Uh, in fact, I went back just to here to, to see when I first uh, got involved with this I, as a graduate student, and I'm not telling you how long it was. I feel like the librarian in the, in the bank card ad and says, holy smokes, that's a lot of years. <laughs> but it's a lot of years. But if you come forward today and look at what's going on, I was wrong in that reservation about doing it. I took, I agreed to uh, share the workshop, and that's what ended up with this book. But uh, the uh, I did it uh, in, in retrospect for the wrong reasons. I was appointed to a committee on the behavior 
cognitive and sensory sciences. I've just been on this board, and uh, my knowledge of these cognitive and sensory sciences were such, I said I better grab this one. I took that one and uh, worked on that uh, uh, workshop. But uh, since then, there's a lot that's going on. I think uh, th I've changed my position on that because there's a lot of good science going on with respect to the, the uh, teams and the science of teams. And as much as anything, I think it's due to the perspective of the team as embedded in a complex system of multiple uh, le leveled system, dealing with the, the, uh, the complexity of individuals, of the, the organizations, and the fact that we can deal with these over time. The theory is far better than it was 10 years ago, and it was, uh, it's that part of it that I think is important. So looking at the this, this science part and put my uh, sort of data hat on, uh, I, I think a lot of improvement has occurred. And second set of data is personal, more uh, an issue of experiential rather than uh, actually uh, the data itself. Uh, I was, uh, at the time, a in the 90s funded by research from the Office of Naval Research, and they had a program, uh, the person there, director, Bill Vaughn, who put together six groups that were doing research on uh, teams. Three of us were behavioral, the others were engineers and math modelers, and were very much different. We, we didn't even know each other, and we got working on this project. From that, I began to see what you can do with these multidisciplinary teams when you're inside, what you can do looking out. So I've got the, the inside looking out, some wonderful stories dealing with the uh, kinds of things that would come up. The, the engineers had wonderful slides and wonderful dynamic things. We had basically boxes and arrows and, and a lucky uh, a moderator. Uh, so we learned, we began to think like, I got beyond this fact of just simply being interdisciplinary, but actually seeing the world the way the other discipline begins to see. And I think that's when you reach that point through the interaction of being able to reinterpret and to uh, gain within the great group the, safe, the safety of being able to say something stupid and not uh, be feeling like you were uh, stepping out of line. It's when you get that kind of sex, uh Feeling. And so it's really that that data put up with what I've known from the literature that uh, convinced me that the science of team sciences deserves to go forward. Thank you. Our, our next uh, speakers will sort of uh, exemplify the theme of the day and deliver a tag team presentation. Um, the the First speaker in this pair will be Dr. Kendra Trugel. Um, and the second, Dr. Patricia Serrano. Dr. Trugel is Associate Dean for Research and Faculty for MSU's Lyman Briggs College. She conducts big data research to understand how global climate change and land use intensification affect la lakes across regions and continents. To understand such complex topics, she brings together collaborators from many disciplines and applies theories and methods from the disciplines of data intensive science, team science, and open science. She'll be followed by Dr. Patricia Serrano, who is professor in the Department of Fisheries and Wildlife. She's a broadly trained ecologist who conducts interdisciplinary research on freshwater ecosystems at continental scales. She enjoys crossing disciplinary boundaries to solve complex problems that benefit from a diversity of perspectives and approaches and also conducts research about the contemporary practice of environmental science. She's the founding editor-in-chief for the Association of the Sciences of Limnology and Oceanography's newest open access journal, Limnology and Oceanography Letters. Dr. Trubel and Serrano. I don't know if you want to use this. Uh, maybe, thank you. I'll just put in a plug that 
pretty sure this is right, Michael, correct me if I'm wrong, that if you haven't yet registered for the Science of Team Science Conference, today's the last day for early bird registration. Oh, that's right, yeah. 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 Thank yeah. you, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I am a big data uh, aquatic ecologist, but that's not my role in this tag team presentation, isn't to talk to you about lakes. Instead, I'm gonna talk to you um, about our research that's looking at collaborative authorship and the role of power dynamics. And just as a little bit of a background, how did I get to here when I study lakes? Um, actually, it started in the classroom. I teach introductory biology, and I do all of my labs inquiry-based, and I do them in student teams, and I'm asking them to do real research. And when I first started teens years ago, that was really hard and didn't go very well. And so I started reading research that was out there in education and organizational psych about teams. And so I got really interested in that. And then as Pat and I uh, worked together, we co-direct the lab, our, over time, our research became more and more data intensive, more and more interdisciplinary. It meant our teams, our research teams were getting bigger and bigger. And so I started, Pat probably got so sick of me because I kept saying, well, you know, in my class, <laughs> we do these things to help the teams work better together. And so we just started bringing in all this science of team science that I had been learning and, and applying in my classroom. And then three-ish years ago, four-ish years ago, we decided that it would be really fun to do a little bit of research in this too. And so we joined forces with a psychologist, a historian, and a philosopher of science to look at what sorts of factors on teams actually affect their ethical um, and behavioral practices. And so that's how I happen to be here to talk to you about collaborative authorship and the role of power dynamics. And I will just say that it's one of my most favorite collaborations is working with a um, with psychologists and historians and philosophers. It's it's really fun. Interdisciplinarity is it's great. Okay, so oops, wrong button. This button, this button. Okay, so why are interdisciplinary science teams on the rise? Obviously, we have lots of complex and societally important challenges. And here's just a, a map of journal cross citations showing how complex our teams are to be able to solve these complex challenges, right? We've got lots and lots of, of people working together across these disciplines. But the reality is, is that authorship position is really important in all of our careers. It determines uh, credit, and obviously that is linked with whether you get a job, whether you're promoted, what your merit review might be. Um, but it's complicated when you start to think about interdisciplinary uh, work, right? Because Authorship norms very much vary by discipline and even within disciplines. So for example, if I take a pretend paper by uh, this research team, in some fields, right, the first, most fields, the first author is that person who had the most contribution, right, to that particular article. In some fields, the last position is a very prestigious position that, that signifies that that person had intellectual um, uh, ownership of the pro of the work. In other fields, such as economics, authorship is, is actually listed alphabetically, right? Not in my field. I wouldn't know that if I looked at someone's CV and saw something that was completely alphabetical, right? And so the idea, oops, sorry, the idea is, is that when you're thinking about authorship credit, you think often in your own discipline, it's actually much more complicated than that. And so it can get really, it can get really messy. And we also know that authorship, some of the practices related with authorship, there can be bias associated with that. So for example, there's a paper by West et al. in 13 where they, um, and we pulled some data from that, where you look at from 1990 to 2001, all the papers in JSTOR, and you see that the last author position, women are underrepresented in that position, right? So there seems to be something going on perhaps with, with the way authorship uh, order is decided. Here's another example from economics. Sarsons in 2017 talked about the, she looked at the likelihood of tenure. And for men in this field, if they had solo author papers, their likelihood of tenure was 75%. Same thing, co-authored uh, all their papers. Well, no difference if women had solo authored their papers. However, if they had co-authored their papers, their likelihood of tenure was 40%. So obviously there's an issue here in this particular case where women are receiving less credit when they co-author papers with men. So what we were interested in is we were interested in looking at power dynamics on teams and how that relates to authorship, right? So power is simply the ability to control or influence decisions, outcomes, and other people. 
And so if you think about people working in a team, the people with the most power have the ability to influence team policies and practices, and they can create or not a culture of inclusion and openness. Less powerful team members are those who feel may feel unable to speak up, may agree to practices that actually don't benefit them if consensus is the goal. So what we did was we did a mixed methods um, research where we did qualitative uh, interviews first. And so we uh, interviewed lead PIs on NSF funded interdisciplinary team projects. And we interviewed early career researchers on those same projects. And I'll just share a couple. We were asking questions about authorship, data sharing, and mentoring. And I'm just going to share a, a quote from, from each of those. Some questions about authorship. The PI says, giving up some of the authorship like corresponding authorship. I have done it a couple times in order to facilitate more future collaboration, although maybe it wasn't the absolutely most fair decision to make, okay? And then an early career researcher from a team, the more authors you have, the less credit you're able to take for getting something published, even if you're the lead author, right? So very different perspectives on in a team, what's happening with authorship and the effects of that on other people. Right? And we saw this over and over again, where the lead PIs would be saying something about authorship that was very different from right, what the early career researchers were saying. And so what we found was, we, and we actually discovered, we think, a new form of honorary authorship that's really about um, the PI, lead PIs would be talking a lot about, well, you know, I just really want to include everybody. Or it's easier to just include everybody and you know I want to be inclusive and I don't want to have any conflict and so they would include everyone as authorship and as an author and so we talk we talk about in our uh, 2018 paper about honorary authorship in this guise of a misguided use of inclusion all right I'm going to try to switch to the next slide and put it into presentation mode shall see okay so then we also followed up these interviews um, with quantitative surveys that went out to hundreds of researchers, again, on NSF-funded interdisciplinary um, environmental science teams. And you don't have to understand this graphic. I just wanted to show that we had many teams with individuals on those teams. We were measuring diversity of the um, teams in terms of disciplinary diversity and demographic diversity and career stages, that kind of thing. And then we were looking at those effects, again, on authorship, data sharing, and mentoring. And we found that there was a mediation effect of the team climate. And so I'm just going to tell you a little bit. The take home, the take home message of this is that climate is better on diverse teams. OK, so the people on the teams that were more diverse reported that their perceptions of the teams were better, OK? However, the people on those teams who contribute that diversity reported having uh, poorer experiences on those teams than everybody else, OK? So and it, especially regarding authorship practices. So again, this idea of power, the people in power, right, have a different experience from those with the people with less power. And in this case, these were the people contributing the diversity, whether it be disciplinary, career stage, or demographic. Okay, should I try one more time? We're almost done. So takeaways from this is that power dynamics are a challenge for collaborative authorship, all right? And so we need to be take, taking that into account. It is difficult to determine contributions of individuals on interdisciplinary collaborative papers, right? It varies by discipline, there's bias involved, and honorary authorship actually may be playing a role in these interdisciplinary teams. And, and, and of course, the lower power team members um, they're often, in our case, what we found was that they were actually positively affecting team climate, but then we're having a, a, a poor experience, especially in terms of authorship. Okay, so that's my part. <laughs> Hopefully it doesn't do that for you. Oh. All right, thank you. So as Kendra said, I'm going to talk now of still about authorship, but we're going to talk about it from the practitioner standpoint and our experiences on our team. So the team I'm going to talk about is the Lagos team. That is a 10-year project. Uh, it's an NSF-funded project that's been funded at about $6.5 million across those 10 years. And to give you a picture of the complexity, I love how Dan referred to teams as complex something systems. And to me, these numbers make it complex. It's large number, 25. There's five disciplines. There's six career stages. And there's 15 early career 
individuals. Um, and as Kendra mentioned, uh, that means power is going to be very important in dealing with this team. So the Lagos project overall, our goal was to build the cyber infrastructure to study water quality and its controls in all US lakes. I'm not gonna say anything more about this, except as Kendra said, it's data intensive. We also had to use um, open science and obviously team science is a big part of what we do. So this is a picture of the team. These are the different disciplines. Um, and some people will think, well, data science and statistics, are those really different? As we've learned, computer science and statisticians are very different. Um, okay, so it's a pretty um, interdisciplinary group. And just further to give you further numbers. So we have published 36 articles. 16 of those articles are multiple disciplines. The average number of authors per paper is eight. And so I put these numbers here not to say, I don't think we're necessarily that productive. It's just a team of this size, you're gonna end up producing this much. And the question is, how do we do it? And how should we decide authorship in a way that is fair across disciplines, career stages, and individuals? And should we maybe be thoughtful and think about it in advance rather than just, um, not really talking about it until conflict arises. So one way we have come up with dealing with this is by focusing on the process of authorship. And specifically our approach was to uh, create an authorship policy, which is a written document that describes the process for assigning authorship. And there's more information at this source down below that we've summarized uh, sort of our lessons learned. So the templates, uh, this is a template that we've created so that others can think about writing um, authorship policies. And these are, these are the basics that should go into a policy that we think. Um, I won't go into them uh, that carefully. I think what's more important is what can authorship policies do? And they can facilitate best practices, such as being proactive rather than reactive to problems with authorship and they can really clarify expectations and responsibilities. Also, they can encourage open and less tense discussions and they can help assign credit. These are the things that early career people really think about. And I think later career people, we kind of forget how important these are. Okay, so things to keep in mind. Policies are most effective when they're co-created by all team members so that those with less power can have a voice. They're living documents, they need to be frequently updated, and they should be used as guidelines. There are no hard and fast rules about authorship, which is a really important thing we've learned. And they should be used for all team manuscripts. So how well have we done with this? Well, in a true assessment, we don't really know, but there's a couple things. One, authorship still continues to be difficult for our team. However, we have open discussions and we also recognize that there's a range of ways to implement uh, our policy. So just to give you an example, what we realized in the beginning, you know, Kendra and I have a fairly collaborative style of working together. And we thought actually our whole team should as well. And so that collaborative style has been referred to as the seven dwarfs style of working together. But we, what we realized is we had to accommodate other styles. So for example, the Batman and Robin style, where two individuals might work together sort of in isolation before involving the rest of the group on a collaborative manuscript. And there is even room for the Han Solo style of collaborative manuscripts, where someone really does a lot of the work, but they still include their co-authors, but maybe not as, as much as in the Seven Dwarves model. So we had to adapt given what our uh, collaborators wanted. So how have we assessed how well we've done? Well, this shows the number of authors on our manuscripts through time. There's some indication that maybe our authorship numbers are getting a little smaller, which, mean, which means maybe we're um, being a little stricter with our authorship. We're not sure if that's the case. And finally, the, the two other metrics we have is that early career team members who have been on our team, who have graduated and gotten faculty positions have wanted to stay on our team and contribute even though they're not funded. Same with senior researchers. So this team is big, complicated, 
um, and people have to give their time to it. And the fact that they've stayed in the team, I think is a good thing. And finally, so how common are authorship policies? Because they seem to work well for us. Well, in this survey Kendra just talked about, we asked for the percentage of surveyed respondents who um, were part of teams without an authorship policy. So authorship policies are rare. Only about 27% of teams had a written authorship policy. And of those teams with a policy, only 53, well, 53% of them were written only by the senior members. So that means half of the written policies do not include the early career or the low power members of the team. So bottom line, authorship is hard. It continues to be hard for us, uh, but we need to pay attention to process, practice, and climate. And it's really the responsibility of those of us in power to get this right. Thank you. And we are uh, running a workshop on this topic at the science, Team Science, if you're interested. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Now, our, <clears throat> thank you very much, Kendra and Pat. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Steve Kozlowski. Uh, Dr. Kozlowski is a professor of organizational psychology at Michigan State. He's a recognized authority in the areas of multi-level theory, team leadership, and team effectiveness and learning, training, and adaptation. He served on the National Academy of Science National Research Council Consensus Committee on the Science of Team Science. He is the Open Science and Methodology Chair for the American Psychological Association and the editor for the Oxford series on organizational psychology and behavior. Dr. Kozlowski. Sure. Have you said anything? <laughs> Okay, so my title is The Science of Team Science Meets the Science of Team Effectiveness, because that kind of encapsulates my experience with this. Uh, just really quickly, I got invited, never, I didn't know there was a Nassan discipline called the Science of Team Science, and I got invited to uh, a conference in Chicago a few years ago, um, and it was, it was a fascinating, because I, I, I studied team effectiveness, and I saw some, it was, it's a multidisciplinary conference. It's really vibrant. People are, are excited. There's a lot of cross-disciplinary connect, connections. But I also saw a lot of old wine and new models. Um, a lot of like discovering stuff that is long buried and should stay that way. Um, and so part of my involvement in this is to, how do we, how do we it's, it's multidisciplinary, but how do we move it forward so we're not reinventing the wheel all the time? So this is kind of the theme of my little, uh, my little ditty today. So I, I just want to start a little bit with the things that I study. So I, I mentioned I'm a multi-level theorist. What does that even mean and why would anyone care? Well, if you're in the organizational sciences, it, it matters because we've sliced organizations, which teams are a part of it, into different disciplines. Uh, I started as a, a student of organizational psychology. We actually study individuals, not organizations. Uh, social psychologists study groups, which is kind of like teams, except mostly it's perceptions of people in groups, not groups per se. Uh, and then you have to go to organizational strategy or organizational theory to look at the more macro level, maybe economics. And we don't talk to each other, we don't publish in the same journals, we use different methods. So just studying organizations is complicated if you can't begin to connect the levels. And since I'm interested in teams, it's interesting, I think, to just reflect on the fact that if you want to study teams, you're talking about four levels. You got person over time, you have between person or within team differences, you have between team differences, and then there's some kind of context or situation that can have differential impacts. So just trying to study teams, four different levels. And most of us aren't trained to deal with that. So part of my career has been trying to think about the theory and the methods to help advance that perspective. And then I study team process dynamics. At least in my field, we talk about team processes, their perceptions that you measure with questionnaires. That's not process. That's sort of a proxy for it. So if you want to study process, you really need to get into the time. And that's some of the things that I've been doing. So I work with folks in medicine to translate what we know into the medical arena. I work with uh, actually an engineering team for a NASA project where, where they have constructed a sensor technology so we can track interactions of people over time with each other really cool data, and um, I work with folks who are trained in computational science and computer science, essentially, or computer science methods, they're psychologists, but we build computational models of systems so that we can study 
imaginary or synthetic teams, but in, at a level of scale that you can't possibly do with humans. So it's really cool stuff, and it all requires cutting across different disciplines. So I'm a, I'm a believer, in, at least in trying to do it. So uh, why team science? So if you track this at all, you know that uh, across all disciplines, more research is published by multi-author teams than in the past. This is true across all the hard science, but also the social sciences and arts and humanities as well. We also know that the most impactful science crosses disciplinary boundaries. And a recent paper that published also shows, I think really interesting, that it's small groups that produce the most disruptive science as opposed to really large groups that tend to be much more cumulative or developmental. Uh, so Michael had mentioned that I was on the uh, Science of Team Science Consensus Committee. If you've never done one of these things, all I can tell you, this is hard work. Uh, they don't pay you anything and you have to sit with some really smart people, which is cool, but we're all from very different disciplines. And if you've done this, you know that the communication challenges are the first big barrier. You're talking about the same words but meaning different things. You're using different words that mean the same thing. That's just really tough work. What I would say is that this particular volume is really impressive, I think, because of its scope and scale. And uh, the last I heard is the most heavily downloaded volume from the National Academy's website. It's free, by the way, if you want to download it, and there's a link at the end, but you can easily Google it and find it. So let's see, I have some animation here, so I'm not sure how this will work. But um, over here, this column, the committee had grappled a lot with why is team science so complicated? So we, they basically came up with a set of dimensions and tried to identify why it's a complicated animal and why you, you really need to be multidisciplinary to study it. And kind of talked also about ranges. You know, if you're if it's simple, well, it might be manageable, but when you're science teams and it's all in this complex end of the continuum, well, that's when things really are difficult and that's why we need science and team science because we don't know how to do that. Um, I am going to try to put this into presentation mode, crossing my fingers. And so one of the things I've tried to do is to say, okay, but a lot of these features we know something about in the science of team effectiveness. And so we don't need to basically start from square zero, we know nothing, but rather, what are the boundary conditions or what's particularly unique about science teams that might ask us to ask some additional questions, but basically take the knowledge that we already have. It just doesn't want to do that. All right, so we'll just move on. But the point is simply that there are a lot of things where you can identify a specific sub-area of team effectiveness, start there, and see if you're asking unique questions or whether something's already known, and other areas where it really is, we don't know much about it. The one I point to is down here. Permeable team boundaries. I mean, if you've been on teams where people flow in and flow out, that's just really hard to do. The only literature I know that actually studies this would be uh, project team sorts of things. They're mostly qualitative studies in the project team literature, but it's not quantitative, and there's really not much of a re what I would call a hard quantitative research foundation on that. And that, that's part of team science. So the idea would be to you know, use what we already know, but then build on top of it, not reinvent the wheel or dig up bodies that have been long dead and should stay that way. Um, here's just a simple framework. I mean, one of the things to think about if you're if you're studying teams is that there are lots of different ways that you can have an impact. I'm trying to think about impact. So one thing I'd point to is that when we look at our literature, we would identify processes as having the most proximal impact on performance outcomes or things that are relevant to the team. There's uh, lots of evidence for particular kinds of cognitive, motivational, affective, and behavioral mechanisms that relate to team effectiveness. Big research foundation, so we start with that, and then we look for those things that can have an influence on process. So it's basically either the inputs, the way you design the team, who's on it, what's the organizational system that it's embedded in, what's the task that they have to perform, uh, or other kinds of interventions like training, development, and leadership that are add-ons. So you have points of leverage that you can identify, and this is useful both for building theory, but also 
if you're a practitioner and you're looking for some information or advice, that's a way to get at it because the literature itself is actually pretty big and diverse. So just to wrap up, uh, there's a lot of robust science on the science of team effectiveness that's directly applicable to the science of teams. Uh, nonetheless, there are boundary areas where being uh, on a, when you talk about team science, we really don't know that much about, and that's where some profitable research can be um, can be engaged. There are points of leverage. Uh, some of those are described in the report if you're interested. And there are areas for research and policy, and this is one of the uh, interests that I have now because this this project was funded by uh, um, Elsevier. I forget which it's somewhere in here, but, but there hasn't been a lot of follow-on. So if you if you get grants from NIH or NSF, you know that you're being encouraged to do this kind of team science, but they're not actually funding research to improve that. They're not really providing a lot of structure to tell you what is it you ought to be doing and in, in building into your proposals. Program managers will complain about the fact that, well, it looked like a multidisciplinary team, but they're not actually doing work in a multidisciplinary way. Well, how about if you provided some structure and some training and some guidelines and some advice and some check boxes and such? So we're trying to have an influence on that. Other big things, I guess, point to the academy, like uh, promotion and tenure, right? This is if you're a young person, you know you're on a big multidisciplinary team. How do you get credit when you're one of five or 10 or 20 authors? And the funding support. So that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Steve. Um, thanks to all of our presenters for your good humor uh, in dealing with the. I don't even really want to touch it at this point. Um, uh, our next speaker is Dr. Melissa McDaniels. Dr. McDaniels is the Senior Advisor to the Dean for Research Mentoring at the Graduate School and Postdoc Office at Michigan State University. She's also co-director of the NIH-supported National Research Mentoring Network Master Facilitator Initiative. Dr. McDaniels is a social scientist who has spent 25 years working with universities and other research-intensive organizations to support inclusive excellence in mentoring and teaching. Her most recent scholarship is in the area of implementation science, specifically focused on how different social ecologies within institutions impact efforts to build capacity for high-quality mentoring relationships among intergenerational research teams. Dr. McDaniels. And of course, I benefit from the previous presenters. I don't think I'm even going to try to put it in presentation mode. I will. Uh, you might not. If you don't need to. I don't. I don't. Nope. I do not need to. And let me awesome. just double. Yep. Perfect. All right. Good afternoon. It's great to be here with everybody. Um, today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, a national scale-up strategy um, that I'm engaged in with colleagues at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Um, as Michael said, I'm at the Graduate School of Michigan State, but also have an appointment as an investigator in the Center for the Improvement of Mentored Experiences and Research at Wisconsin, and also um, working with colleagues in the CTSA of the Wisconsin uh, Medical School. So what I wanted to do today I'm actually going to start with some of our results of the scale up and then back up to give you some context, talk about our scaling intervention, a little bit of the infrastructure that we had to put together um, to support this work. And um, we got um, a $13 million grant from um, NIH, but NSF has also been very active in supporting this. Um, I'll revisit the results and talk about some next steps. So since 2010, our group um, has trained over 7,300 research mentors in um, a curriculum with standardized competencies. I'm not going to be talking about the curriculum itself today, but other to say that it is, um, has been tested through a randomized control trial in 2014 in academic medicine. We have, there's an article on that by my colleagues, and it was a double-blind trial. So um, the um, the preview I will give you also at the Lansing Center. Um, if you want to learn more about what that curriculum is um, and the structure, Katie Colby from the College of Engineering and I will be running a workshop, three-hour workshop um, come May on that topic. So research mentoring matters. Um, we know through the research it's been linked to enhanced science identity, increased persistence, especially in STEM, increased research productivity, career satisfaction. And in particular, it's been very much linked to successful retention, recruitment, 
and advancement of minoritized scholars across all career stages. And again, mentoring is not the only determinant of success, but it is a major one um, in the likelihood of success. A little bit of context. Um, there is actually currently, and it's going to be come out next fall, um, there's a consensus study on research mentoring that is actually um, being undertaken. My colleagues at the University of Wisconsin are actually um, sharing this. Um, and that's actually going to be a really neat opportunity, I think, to have some dialogue between these two streams of literature. Um, there is an increasingly inc increasing interest on the part of funding agencies to study the science of mentorship. Um, and again, um, especially the National Science Foundation has been engaged in a lot of um, support to adapt this evidence-based curriculum for a bunch of different um, disciplines. So our intervention is a train-the-trainer program. Um, my colleagues published about this in CBE Life Sciences Education several years ago. And for me, as an organizational scholar and an educator, there's a, it provides a really unique opportunity to, discover, to study scale-up because we actually have an evidence-based intervention. There's an open access curriculum, um, so it's easily accessible, and there is an efficacious facilitator training. So a, it's a pretty simple model and approach, and I apologize for the abbreviations. We wanted to, over this period, um, increase the number of workshops um, to deliver this facilitator training. Again, I'll share the number before and after numbers with you at the end. That will result in trained facilitators, so faculty at institutions across the United States who could implement this research mentor training curriculum. Um, again, implementing those in their context, in their departments, in their graduate schools, and ultimately leading to that number that we really care about is an increase in the number of mentors trained. So we had to think about, you, don't, you can't just run a, a train the trainer workshop, you need to think about what type of infrastructure you can put together to support the longevity of both the train the trainer program, but once these folks get back out into the field, we call them facilitators in the wild, how they can continue to do their good work. And there's four different elements that I'll talk a little bit about today. First, we developed a master facilitator initiative. This initiative enabled us to basically go from delivering one facilitator training workshop up to 36, um, and also um, implement some nationally based research mentor training workshops in disciplinary society meetings. Um, we've gotten a lot of um, support to adapt the curriculum. For example, this started out in the biomedical sciences. I'm currently adapting the curriculum for the national laboratories, working with the American Physical Society um, in DC. And what that did was it has actually opened um, the venues for people to be who would be interested in using this beyond the biological sciences. We um, put together, provided some implementation resources. So what is that? These are tools to help with recruitment when one gets back to campus to implement these programs, helping making a case, evaluation resources, and a lot of other things that we'll talk about in the workshop in uh, May. Um, I mentioned the adaptation of the curriculum. This is a really big piece. We have a standardized approach to evaluation for this, for this work. As I said, there's standardized competencies. There's something called the mentoring competency assessment that's used. And if anyone attends one of these facilitator trainings, they have lifetime access to this, um, this measure. Um, Wisconsin produces an evaluation document um, for them. I'm doing a training next week. Um, Wisconsin is providing the evaluation uh, instrument. And as a result, we have data um, um, over the past 10 years about how people are um, doing in these workshops. So, um, again, we went from one to uh, 34 facilitator training workshops. We were able to increase the number of trained facilitators, so the, those facilitators in the wild, as I say, to 834. Um, this is, these are very conservative numbers due to some of the questions I'm going to raise about tracking. Um, 515 mentor training workshops have been implemented, and again, 7,300 mentors trained. And again, I would guess this is probably conservative by about 30%. Um, we just published, um, um, I just published with my colleague Kim, um, a description of this sustainable infrastructure in CBE Life Sciences Education in 2018. Um, so really, um, the next steps and questions, we want to, number one, on a practice-based level, support the trained facilitators. They've gotten exposed to this curriculum, but we know from the broader implementation science literature, especially in public health, 
you know, not everyone implements these things when they go to a train the trainer uh, program. So um, some of the things we're trying to do is both to promote community amongst these scholars, um, as well as really try to find out what resources they need to land back and try to do this work in their institutions. I will tell you right now, we have 15 trained facilitators at Michigan State who are implementing on this campus right now. Um, and I'll be happy to talk to you any more about um, the strategy we're using here. We have started to track um, implementation in a couple of ways. We have um, a national implementation survey that we do every year um, um, that, number one, we our aims were to track people's implementation. Um, the, you know, the response rate isn't that high. We're going to be thinking about how do we make that assessment sustainable and as non-intrusive um, as possible. And finally, and this gets to my interest, we're really interested in, you know, just because you can facilitate something doesn't mean you just plop yourself back on your campus. What are the institutional challenges and supports? financial, political, administrative, et cetera, um, that these facilitators are facing. And many of the things we've thought about is, you know, this is really actually a leadership development effort um, there. So that's where we are right now. I definitely beat the five minutes, um, but um, I'll be happy to talk with you more about this. And as I said, um, 15 of us on this campus are doing this work right now um, and hope to introduce you to it. Thanks. Thank you, Melissa. Our uh, final speaker today will be Dr. Dr. Stephanie Vasco. Dr. Vasco is a trained chemist and nanotechnologist who now serves as the managing director for the MSU Center for Interdisciplinarity. She is also a co-chair for the program committee for this year's CITES conference, as well as a member of the executive committee. Her work focuses on understanding structured dialogues in team settings through technological approaches. And I'm going to attempt to technologically approach this problem by getting rid of it. So, sweet. Right, we are over this. <laughs> Let's all be real. I'm the only thing standing between you all and mixing. So, very from the start. So yeah, if you're attending Science of Team Science 2019 and you want early bird registration, please make sure to do it today so that you get the early bird rate. And if you have already, and if you have submitted an abstract, I've probably read it and you've probably heard from me. And if I haven't met you, please come up and introduce yourself to me. So Michael uh, told you all that I started off as a chemist and a nanotechnologist, and I did a lot of team science. Um, I published a whole bunch of interdisciplinary co-authored papers as a team scientist. Here I am at the Advanced Light Source nine years ago. But during my time in my PhD program, I started working on nanoethics. I took a um, postdoctoral position at Penn State looking at STEM ethics education. I then took a postdoctoral position here working on the Toolbox Dialogue Initiative. And now I'm the managing director for the Center for Interdisciplinarity. So really, I think I do team humanities now. But Michael showed you that uh, really great Venn diagram that had the three circles, right, and talked about the three different types of communities that participate in the CITES conference. And I would say I constantly sit at the middle of that. I think about my experiences as a team scientist. I think about how we do the science of team science. I think about being a practitioner. And I think about building tools. So I want to talk a little bit about building tools today. So what do teams and collaborators do? This is an open question for you all. What do, what do teams do? Anyone can shout something out at me. What's the number one thing teams do? Solve problems. I would say it's they talk, <laughs> which all of these answers get to. Um, and they talk in different ways, right? So they talk in written, um, send emails, Slack messages, Teams, Trello, Google Chat, all of the different methodologies. But we also talk a lot orally. Um, in meetings, we give presentations like these. Frantic phone calls from your PI at like <laughs> 2 o'clock in the morning, right? These are all things that happen when you're a member of a team or a collaboration. Wouldn't it be great if we could use all of this talking we do to predict or intervene on how we work in teams or how we collaborate? So one of the things we've been thinking about at the Toolbox Project, or Toolbox Dialogue Initiative, I see my toolboxers in the back giving me that look. Um, this is my fault. Um, what if we thought about a machine learning approach? So I want to start off with a definition of machine learning because I think this has been a little bit ambiguous um, across the board. So in the most basic sense of the term, machine learning takes a set of data, learns from it, and uses it to make predictions on other data. Or even simpler, um, from this book, which um, if you're interested in machine learning, I really suggest Thoughtful Machine Learning with Python, a uh, tech-driven approach. 
Machine learning is a type of artificial intelligence whereby an algorithm or method extracts patterns from data. So that's all we were talking about today, extracting patterns from data in the way that we talk together. And there are multiple types of machine learning, and these are things that you're probably familiar with or seen in your everyday life. So there are things like supervised learning, certain outcomes, and given inputs. Classification, predicting a class or a label, so something like the quality of wine, or if any of you have learned Python or R, the species of an iris, the most boring data set ever. There's the task of regression, predicting a continuous output. That's something like salary or housing prices. And then there are tasks that fall into unsupervised learning, where you have no given outputs, but you have given inputs. And those are things like clustering or grouping data. So customer segmentation is another one of them. Um, this is another really great book, Introduction to Machine Learning of Python, in case you're interested in learning more about this. So I'm going to talk to you a bit about this case study, the Toolbox Dialog Initiative, in partnership with IBM's Watson Tone Analyzer. Toolbox Dialog Initiative, how many people here, and you can choose or not to raise your hand to this, have participated in a toolbox workshop, or know about a toolbox workshop. Let's make it even bigger. So Toolbox uh, Dialog Initiative, we do project integration in cross-disciplinary contexts with dialog-based workshops. We do talk and we make people talk. So we work in the classroom and we work for and with research groups. Uh, we help groups examine their perspectives and discover and manage their differences. We use philosophical prompts to drive dialogue and co-creation. And we have an IRB that allows us to collect the audio data of the dialogues. We use prompts that look like this, um, things like, an interdisciplinary project can be successful even if no project member understands all parts of the project. We ask people to rate where they fall with that and then have a discussion about these prompts. We've run over 300 of these worldwide. So we have an initial project that you'll hear about the deep machine learning details of if you come to the science, Team Science 2019. Um, but today I'm going to give you a short overview. And this project is in collaboration with researchers at IBM as well as with Marissa who's in the back and Michael who's in the front. We have a, a draft manuscript and process hopefully submitted by May. So IBM's Tone Analyzer tool is a machine learning tool that looks at different types of tones in um, written settings. So it looks at emotion, social propensity, and language styles. So imagine you want to measure anger in your collaboration when you're having a discussion with your collaborators. Uh, with your collaborators. So we have time and speaking turns. And all of a sudden, you see these two spikes in anger. And you think, are there interventions I could have done in this dialogue? Are there ways I could have seen this happening where I might have been able to shift the conversation or I might have been able to pursue an intervention within that collaboration in these written moments? So this is a segment of some toolbox data um, where we transcribe the audio recordings of people having a conversation. And we look at all of the different tones that the IBM Tone Analyzer looks at. So you can see this one in the top right is confidence, and we have one spike, and it's because that person said the word absolutely as a filler. If you see these ones down in sadness, um, one of those spikes corresponds to the phrase economic depression. So you can see we're getting some crossfire with the tool. The other uh, one I really like to use is I went, out, I went to Iceland last summer. Um, and so the way that I tested whether or not the Tone Analyzer works really well is to throw in the list of things that I wanted to do while I was in Iceland. So if you just say volcano, it's going to tell you it's got an over 0.75% chance of uh, being a fear response. If you say hike of, uh, see a volcano, there's not a lot of emotion there. If you put the whole list in, it seems ride a horse as joy. So it finally sees the right thing, right? Right. Finally sees the right thing. I really enjoyed riding this horse. So here's the problem. The tone analyzer is trained on written customer service data, and we're running it on transcribed audio about a variety of subjects. We have false positives. We need to identify by context what these spikes correspond to. This might be the inappropriate training set for this data. So we're looking at possible changes to our experimental design in running this. We're going to train on our raw audio data instead of the written data. We're going to train it on our own data. And we're going to create a set of toolbox workshops where people see the same exact prompts. And we have people from the same exact backgrounds. So we can create a training set that um, is a little more unified. There are some ethical and social dimensions to machine learning that I don't think we talk enough about. And it's something that we, as the Toolbox Dialogue Initiative, are going to explore when we think about thinking about machine learning in the team science perspective. And those are bias and algorithms bias and training sets, and the ethical adaptation of tools by funding agencies. Right, so we need to still um, think about those, but there's one down here that I also want to think about, and it's this idea of doing human-centered machine learning or human-centered AI, which is to put the person at the center and not necessarily the economic driver or the need to innovate, 
but to instead think about um, how this really benefits the members of the team. So the way that Toolbox is going to look at this going forward is to do exploratory data analysis. We're going to see what things correspond to each other. We're going to do some algorithm development using scikit-learn and Python. We're going to test and predict on our data. We're going to try some interventions, and we're going to refine that algorithm. So that's the way that we're thinking about using machine learning for the science of team science perspective. Um, this is a pretty large uh, 10,000 foot overview. So if you have any other questions, please feel free to contact me. Thank you.